Hello, this is Jordan Reese, U.S. Sales Director, 3D Imaging for CareStream Dental. And I'm here with Dr. Shalise Katal as part of our CareStream Dental University program doing a CBCT anatomical review of the maxillary region. Let me introduce Dr. Katal. As an experienced oral and maxillofacial radiologist, Dr. Katal has extensive knowledge in both the radiology and 3D imaging fields, with a specialized focus on cone beam CT imaging technology. Trained at University of Missouri, Kansas City, Dr. Katal now serves as the director of 3D imaging at CareStream Dental. His most recent appointment included acting as a clinical assistant professor at NYU School of Dentistry and serving as the head of a specialty group of oral and maxillofacial radiologists. In his roles, Dr. Katal has been asked to speak extensively on various aspects of clinical radiology in national and international venues and has served as a keynote speaker on numerous occasions. Dr. Katal remains on the cutting edge of technology by maintaining active clinical research involving radiology and 3D imaging. Dr. Katal, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Jordan. Thank you for having me here again. Excellent. Yes, very excited uh, doing a second part of our CareStream University and very happy to have you on board. Again, I do want to state uh, as we had stated with our, our previous uh, uh, time together, but this is a cursory overview. We are not showing a complete overview of the scan. This is not how to do a complete radiology read. There is a time and place for that. But our, I, our concept here is to do short courses that are uh, interesting for those that are able to watch and get to the point very quickly. So let me jump right in. What are the most commonly visualized anatomical structures in the maxillary region? Well, Jordan, that is uh, a fairly simple question if you think about it. Uh, as, as with any other heart tissue, one of the most commonly visualized uh, anatomical landmarks are the cortical bone, you know, and by the cortical bone, we are looking um, at the integrity of the cortical bone as such. Um, the cancellous bone, which is within the cortical bone, and you can see right there the cancellous bone, um, which is a part or which is encased into the cortical bone. And then, of course, you have the trabeculation pattern with the cancellous bone, which also notifies the or signifies the health of the bone by itself and the density of the bone. And like I mentioned earlier, um, traditional methods of evaluating the density of the bone does not apply, so it's a little bit different criteria. Now, besides these, uh, the most or few most important things are a set of sinuses that happen to be um, also in the maxillary region and are mostly included within the scans. Oh, are you referring to the paranasal sinuses? That is absolutely correct. The paranasal sinuses are exactly, uh, they are abbreviated as the PNS, um, which can be noted in many anatom uh, anatomy texts. Uh, but paranasal sinuses are the one. They are three. Uh, there are three of them, actually. The maxillary sinus, the ethmoid sinus, and the sphenoid sinus. Now, as you can see, if you look at the, uh, the coronal view, you do see the maxillary sinus bilaterally. Th there you go. You know, you have the right and the left side, and that's the maxillary sinus. And once you go to the sagittal view, uh, which is a much better view to see Oh, I, I apologize. Let's go to the axials. I apologize. Let's go to the axial view. Great. And in the axial view, what, what the arrows point out is those webby-shaped structures, the web-shaped structure, which is nothing but the ethmoid sinus, which is another sinus which happens to be a little bit posterior to the maxillary, a little bit posterior and superior to the maxillary. And for the posterior, where you can see the two large compartments, that is the sphenoid sinus, uh, which are located in the sphenoid bone. And they all form together the paranasal sinuses. Excellent. So let me just, uh, if you could show us the, oh good, if you could show us the height that you are at right here for where we're looking at this axial scan. Um, I can see now that you're demonstrating it on the 3D rendering. We could see where these cross, uh, cross, 
where these transect, and we can see the height that we are at. So now that we have the scan and one can see the sinuses, what is the importance of evaluating the sinuses? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. The sinus health is important to discern and distinguish from any sinus disease uh, or to distinguish any sinus disease from pathology of odontogenic origin. What I am trying to say is that there could be some pathology that's located in the sinus which may not be exactly due to of exactly due to uh, um, a problem that originates from the sinus. It could originate from the jaw and then tra you know kind of transmit itself into the sinuses, or uh, vice versa. That could happen the other way around too. So by understanding the sinus health, you are able to make sure that you are dis you are treating the right disease of the jaw. So of course, with with diagnosis being of utmost importance, you're you're trying to clarify or bring attention to the fact that some of the diseases of the maxillary jaw can be mistaken for sinus disease or vice versa. That is correct. That is absolutely so, correct. What are the important anatomic landmarks of the maxillary sinus? The you know, one of the easiest way to look at it, there, there are not a whole lot of landmarks to evaluate, but the ones that are there are very important. Uh, firstly, when you look into the sinus, you see the floor of the sinus. Floor of the sinus is very simple to identify. It is nothing but the most uh, inferior point of the sinus. And then you have the lateral wall of the sinus right there, the lateral wall. And then you have the roof of the sinus, which is the topmost extension, which also borders with the, in, uh, with the infraorbital rim um, or the lower border of the orbit. And then you have the medial wall of the sinus. Now, the medial wall of the sinus does not seem to be continuous because it is actually a very paper-thin wall, and some parts of it may not be captured by a scanning. But those, uh, those are the most important anatomical structures that you see. Now, besides that, if you look carefully, it also, it also demonstrates a very important structure that is called as the ostium. The ostium can be bilaterally visualized right in that area, and you can see it extending all the way from sinus into the nasal cavity. Now, keep in mind, the nasal cavity also can be visualized in the maxillary sinus, so it might be of, of, of importance to keep an eye on any kind of uh, disease uh, that, that could happen within the nasal cavity. So now that you've mentioned the ostium, what is its importance, and, and how do you evaluate the ostium? What are you looking for? That is, that is, uh, a, that is a very good question. Ostium signifies one thing. It signifies the patency of the maxillary sinus um, in total. What does that mean? It, it shows that the, how the maxillary sinus drains into the middle meatus of the nasal cavity. So by having the ostium open, what that implies is that you have fairly healthy sinus. Now keep in mind, because of ostium, it is not a sterile area. Sinuses are not sterile areas. But when you have the ostium open, it shows that the sinus is fairly healthy. And if the ostium is blocked, it is, an, it is a sign of chronic sinus disease uh, of any nature. It could be a varied nature. I mean, there's no one thing to it, but you have to further um, examine the patient uh, for any other chronic diseases or acute even. OK, so what does one do if occult pathology is noted within the sinuses? Well, I think, Jordan, you're referring to what you're seeing in the sinus right now, uh, the little bit gray area that you see within the sinus. Yeah. That, is a, um, that is a good question. Now, if you notice, it's actually bilateral. Uh, when we move the scan, you can see that it's not just on the left side. You can also see it on the right side. Now, uh, of course, in this case, it just looks like uh, polypoid-like lesions, uh, lesion on the right, maybe a little bit of um, you know, exaggerated mucoperiosal thickening on the left. Um, now, it is important to note that there's always some part of, of uh, a peri mucoperiosal layer that could be always a little bit infl uh, inflamed due to the non-sterile nature of the sinus by itself. But something of this nature probably should be of a little bit of a concern. Um, and, the, and the reason being is when you see these uh, kind of pathology, you should be able to uh, treat the pathology before doing any dental procedures, or at least be able to distinguish that the pathology is not from 
dental related or is this, uh, and it is independent to the sinus bite itself. And when you see something like that, it is important to take a consultation um, to with with concerned parties. You know, let the inform, let the patients know about it. Um, take a consultation from experts of that area. Well, if I recall from past conversations with you, soft tissue anatomy is not able to be visualized with CBCT. So why are we able to see uh, the soft tissue that you've just pointed out here in the sinus? Oh, good memory, uh, Jordan. That is exactly correct, uh, and that's, uh, that's, an ex uh, that's an excellent point that you noted there, that, yes, it is correct um, that soft tissue anatomy or soft tissue contrast um, cannot be identified um, no matter what kind of CBCT unit that you use. But in this case, you're able to see soft tissue contrast within the sinus because sinus generally has to be black because it's nothing but air that's in there. So in that background, it, there's enough contrast for the soft tissue structure or the soft tissue pathology to show up. And that is the only reason you are able to see uh, sin or sinus pathology. So, so let me understand this better. So on a CP, CBCT, regardless of model, regardless of manufacturer, not being able to visualize soft tissue is a characteristic, or, or better stated, a limitation of this imaging modality. Uh, I would exactly phrase it that way. You're absolutely right. Okay. Um, so as long as we're on the subject of limitations of cone beam CT, uh, I understand that uh, caries detection, uh, caries cannot be diagnosed either. Uh, would you care to comment? Uh, that is very good. Um, it, is a, it is a good point. Now, doing a CBCT scan to understand or to visualize caries would be a, certainly an overkill, and it is not advocated for that. For caries diagnosis, the traditional intraoral methods probably hold the best. I mean, use your best receptor, all those things hold better. Your bite wings, your um, uh, regular periapicals that you do, those are all the modalities that you probably need to rely on for now as it comes to di diagnosing caries and diagnostic imaging in caries as such. So a uh, higher resolution sensor like our RVG 6100 or 6200, uh, which offer greater than 21 line pairs per, per millimeter uh, would be the best option for identifying caries. That is correct. And the key being a high resolution sensor would be would be the best way to go ahead and choose the highest highest and the fastest receptor, highest resolution and the fastest receptor, and do intraoral images with that. So to you know, and simply put, the answer is yes. Okay. Well, let me let me get back to what we were on. Uh, interesting aside that we got on, and I do think it's important to point out not just the benefits of cone beam CT, but as we have mentioned here, some of the limitations. But let's go back into the subject, and, and let me ask you another question: What are the most important landmarks to be considered while planning for implant surgery in the maxillary jaw? Well, you know, if you look at the cross-sectionals, you can clearly see, um, I'm going to go back to all the way to the posterior area, and we would use the traditional, uh, you know, the, the traditional way of interpretation. So you have the cross-sectional, which I uh, tend to refer to as one of the most important um, sections that you would use for implant surgery. And these shots shows the cross-sectional view of the of the crestal ridge, of the jaws, and by that what I mean is I'm getting the buccal lingual aspect, which is a third dimension that is missing in a two-dimensional radiograph. Now you can notice over here, um, I mean, and for a second, let's uh, ignore the pathology that is sitting in the sinus. You can notice how uh, the ridge is almost non-existent, or, and it, it's probably as thin as it can get. And you can even notice that there's some, probably a couple of breaches on the ridge through which there's um, you know, uh, which communicates into the maxillary sinus. Now, as we go a little bit anterior, you would probably see that, let me show this to you a little bit slower. As we go anterior, you would notice that there is a change in the shape of the ridge by itself from the non-existent. As you go further, let me take you all the way middle. And there you see, there's, you can notice now that there's a little bit more better ridge anatomy. You're getting a little bit more height. And which seems like, you know, like from a non-existent, it has come to almost like 8.4 millimeters. And as you go further, 
um, anterior, you're able to even gain some ridge width there, in fact, which is, which is actually very good for somebody who wants to get uh, some sort of implant surgery done. And now you see there's even, even better gain. Even the quality of bone has increased in there. You see more trabeculation of the bone. You see that the cortical bone seems to be a little bit more intact. Um, and those kind of things. Now, the key point to note is that now just being even on one side of the patient, just on one side of the patient, you've seen the variation all the way from non-existent ridge to ridge that could go up to like 8, 9, or 10 millimeters in height. It, excuse me. Is it, is it common to see that large of a discrepancy between the anterior and posterior height of the ridge? That is a good point. In patients that stay edentulous for a long period, um, resorption can be seen depending on the thickness of the bone that was existing and the type of extraction that was done. But yes, on, long, on patients who have stayed um, edentulous for a long, longer term, it is, it, is absolutely, um, it is absolutely possible. And that also shows the value of CBCT imaging in such patients where you suspect a uh, large amount of uh, ridge atrophy. Now, if you look at the contralateral, uh, if you oh, sorry. The contralateral, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jordan. Go ahead. I, I just noticed something as you were scrolling through there that I wanted to point out. I um, does the bone look different on the on the contralateral side? Uh, more, yeah. Keep going. Uh, right here. You are correct. That's that's uh, you have good eyes on that. So that looks like there was some sort of like a graft procedure that was done in that area and a possibly a small graft that was done and it seems like the graft just kind of also degrading a little bit. Um, you know, this also shows the importance of having these kind of images or CBCT images for pre and post graft procedures where you can evaluate the area to be grafted and post surgically you can evaluate the uh, osteointegration of the graft to the bone by itself. Oh, it's very interesting. Um, I, I notice uh, on this 9300, uh, CS9300 premium 17 by 6 centimeter scan, uh, the field of view that we are working with, which is just one of the many different options for fields of view scans with the 9300, that one can visualize more than just the maxillary region. One can also see and evaluate uh, the bilateral TMJ. That is right, Jordan. You know, so that, that shows um, that by having a larger field of view, you'll be able to capture a little bit more than the maxilla. You'll be able to get, capture a little bit more posterior area, such as, the, um, su such as the TMJ area. So by limiting the field of view and just by capturing the maxilla, now you, you would also be able to save the patient from a lot of radiation. You would be able to also capture just enough anatomy that you need for a certain procedure as opposed to capturing a large field where you have more anatomy to evaluate, more structures to evaluate, um, and also, you know, it would be a responsible way to limit the field of view to reduce the amount of radiation. Well, I, I think it would bring us to a completely different conversation on TMJ imaging, uh, which is uh, going a little bit beyond what we're covering today. but. Maybe I could get you to join me again for another anatomical view, uh, this time of the temporomandibular joint in another session of CareStream University. Well, that's a good idea. I think that holds for a separate conversation by itself. Excellent. Well, let's keep this one short. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, always enlightening and uh, appreciate your point of view. If uh, someone who's watching this has more information, Please contact a CareStream Dental Representative by calling 1-800-944-6365 or visit us on the web at carestreamdental.com. Of course, I am always available. Uh, here is my name, my email address, and my extension to be able to reach out to me. So thank you very much uh, for your time, Dr. Katal. I look forward to working with you some more and uh, look forward to recording more sessions uh, for our customers and prospects. Thank you very much.